Welcome to the Doomer okay. Optimism Podcast. Today, we are with Lindsay Borgon, who is a writer, oral historian, and intriguingly, a National Geographic Explorer, which actually is something that, if we have time, I'd maybe like to talk to you about. She writes about the environment, history, culture, land issues, identity, um, and she's been published in everything from The Atlantic, The Smithsonian, The Guardian, and again, intriguingly, The Oxford American, uh, for those of you down south, along with yes. the big names in Canadian publishing, for those Canadian li listeners, uh, The Walrus, Hazlitt, etc., um, I am James Pogue, a uh, sort of doomer optimist adjacent uh, fellow journalist uh, who writes for Vanity Fair and Harper's and also writes about land issues in the West. So for those of you who hate journalists, we got two journalists talking to each other today. Uh, get ready. But two journalists who I, I mean, and I don't know how you feel about this, but I, you know, I'm very blessed with my where my work appears, but I operate kind of outside of the the sphere of. A lot Indeed. of journalism, I think. Yeah. yeah. And I think that's maybe why that's how Lindsay and I came to know each other's work. Um, I think we yeah. operate both 100%. in our physical spheres and in how we choose to publish stuff like a little outside mm -hmm. that mainstream game, uh, while also publishing within it, too. So a little inside outside. Um, yeah. And then for a little extra context here, Lindsay's book, which we're going to talk about, uh, which is called Tree Thieves, uh, is about timber poaching across the world. But a lot of the stories that she's telling are set in a region of far Northern California where I happen to have been living for most of the last year. And if anybody's interested, there's an earlier DO podcast with me talking about some of that stuff, uh, but not specifically the region that Lindsay is talking about, which is uh, a part of California known as the Lost Coast or the Redwood Coast, or uh, there's a few other names for it, Humboldt County region, Del Norte County region, uh, those areas. Yeah. So we're going to get into that. Um, but I wanted, I'm looking at my notes here, and I wanted to start with a kind of big picture thing. Um, Sure. About how, because the subtext of your book is about how humans can interact with nature in ways that could possibly be beneficial, could possibly be not actively detrimental, um, and also ways in which humans attempt to protect nature in ways that can end up harming nature and the communities around it. And so I wanted to get first your views on a UN initiative known as 30 by 30. Um, which is something Ooh. that the Biden administration has signed on to, um, and that mm -hmm. in theory is a big plan to reshape how humans interact with nature. Um, whether or not it comes to pass, we shall see. Uh, but the vision mm -hmm. is a little more controversial than I think a lot of people understand. So I was wondering if you could start by explaining that. Yeah, I'd love to. I, 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 this is very good. You're inverting the structure of my book. So most people ask me to kind of anyway 30 by 30 or 30 is it 3430 good question 30 i wrote 3430 30 by 30 is i think yeah is the espn right. video <laughs> series anyway okay. Fair um, enough. Okay. so <laughs> the goal of it is to conserve 30 percent of the earth's landmass uh by 2030 right uh and so i uh, I bring that up at near the end of my book when I'm talking about community conservation because 30 for 30 is notably lacking in um, considering community uh, community perspective, community management. Um, I suppose you know it has a very straightforward definition of conservation which is that there will be no human use in these land areas or in the you know land ocean what have you so um, it's sorry to stop you it, but so that yeah. just for people who don't understand that is really different than the what we think of as conserved lands in the american west today in general like our yeah. national forests yeah. have active human use our our public deserts yes. blm land have active public use so something like mm -hmm. 30 for 30 as i understand it is much closer to the nature conservancy vision of conservation where you put put a Indeed. literal fence around it um yes and even national parks now there's you know there is a certain amount of use that goes on in maintaining 
those parks, right? So a tree right. falls over a road, you go in, you move the tree, uh, you keep the tree, uh, you know, along the side of the road or wherever it, you know, wherever it fell. But uh, this is this is like a pretty hard line idea of what conservation is, which is essentially enclosing it off from all human use and saying, we don't go past this border, we don't go past this boundary. It is it is adapting and and um, sort of uh, evolving mm -hmm. back to whatever the untouched version of this world would be. That's what thirty for thirty is. Um, it has you're right, been been adapted and adopted. And and I guess you sign on to it. Maybe you know the correct term there. Um, I'm not sure that that is the correct term. I do know that it's something that has been publicly endorsed by the Biden administration. Yeah, okay, um, exactly. You it, it is endorsed and kind of brought on by governments and, and different sorts of organizations who are essentially behind it. But there has been a lot of negative, you know, a lot of criticism around what it could mean. And that's because it's a very colonial view of what wilderness and nature is to think that the best nature, the, the most ideal, uh, nature friendly, uh, pure, essentially, idea of what the environment is doesn't include humans, that humans are always a detriment, mm -hmm. and never a help. Uh, and so, you know, for a lot of countries around the world, this you know, it, it essentially will remove indigenous access to traditional lands. Uh, it, it also just removes any sort of human human touch, whether that be for economics or, you know, uh, subsistence gathering, hunting, uh, recreation. All of all of this, uh, it removes it from from the table. Um, the and irony. The, Oh, sorry to yeah. stop you, but but there's a, there's a very funny irony here in the United States where you have, I'm not to left right this, but you have on one side of environmental things, um, especially in the Western United States, the uh, the sort of land back movement, um, indigenous mm -hmm. activists who are very very critical of the idea of wilderness on the grounds that you know, arguing that there never was a wilderness in, in the United States. Mm. It was always something that was tended like a garden by native tribes and things like this. And then on the other mm. side, you have, for lack of a better term, rednecks who are like, you need us to thin these forests, to log, society needs us to mine, wilderness is a fantasy. Um, and also mm. somewhere in the middle, you have land management agencies that want to do fire stuff and do thinning projects mm -hmm. and to bring fire back to these landscapes. Which actually, mm -hmm. in fairness, our wilderness policy, I think, has been generally pro that stuff. Um, I don't know about in Canada, but it's been generally wilderness areas have often attempted to reintegrate fire and often have done better than places that are not explicitly wilderness. Mm -hmm. But that's another weird yeah, way. Um, okay. Oh, no, yeah, I, I, I kind of waffle back and forth on that. I mean the kind of heyday of conservation history, you know, fire really was seen as a bad thing, a thing to prevent. I think that in Canada, the way that it has been sort of reintroduced um, and accepted is, is through the lens of Indigenous guardians and, and traditional practice. And um, it's, uh, you know, that is seen as sort of the the ideal path at this point in time, which is that we're going to have fire and it's going to be done traditionally by the local First Nations, which is kind of the term that we would use up here for, mm -hmm. I think down there, you'd say tribal council or what have you. Um, and and that has been the, the sort of quote unquote solution to this issue of many years of just not clearing the brush and and basically allowing fuels to collect on the forest floor that makes these fires much worse right mm -hmm. um but yeah i don't know if that answers the question i mean it's all kind of goes with the whims of uh like you were saying the left right thing so i think that there's an there's considered to be sort of the right way to burn and the wrong way to burn um and the fire stuff is kind of all wrapped up in land back for sure. Right. Mm -hmm. I would say I, I same think, up here. Well, here, I think it's a little actually different. I think. Okay. What we have is essentially, I mean, it's a funny, it's a funny side story. I'm, and uh, I'm not 
100 mm. sure I've told this on this podcast before. So, uh, but basically, there was an, an organization of biologists and foresters and stuff called Tall Timbers that uh, was based somewhere in Florida, because uh, a lot of the good fire stuff um, in the US in the first half of the 20th century uh, was in the Southeast, actually, oddly. Interesting. Um, yeah. And Tall Timbers was a, an annual conference where people got together and pushed like, hey, we need fire back on these landscapes, particularly in the West. Mm -hmm. They folded up in 1972 with the quote hmm. that we won the argument. And so the, the land management really? agencies, yeah, in 1972, the land management agencies yeah, at wow. the Boise Inter Interagency Center, um, which is sort of <laughs> a gathering place for these people, they were like, this is what we are doing, that we are bringing fire mm. back. And they started, the places that you could bring fire back first and easiest were through the National Park Service yeah. and in oh, wilderness okay, yeah. areas of national parks, because parks is more flexible. Mm -hmm. And so... It was actually the Park Service operating in wilderness areas that was the first kind of like rejuvenation of fire on the American Western mm. landscape. And yeah, then, I, that's fascinating, right? Because the public, as we know, the public perception of this is only just now starting to change. Yes. And that so this is the thing is they won the internal argument and mm -hmm. they lost the public argument and they lost the regulatory. Yeah. argument. And so mm -hmm. now. It, they basically that started and people thought, hey, this is going to be this is going to be a success. And there was mm -hmm. one disaster fire. And I forget when that was late 70s, something like that. There was one that got mm -hmm. out and got out of control. And that was basically it. And now mm -hmm. you're seeing um, in, you know, in areas that you work and report in, the big thing is yeah. sort of tribal and forest service partnerships because yeah. the tribes are really yes. good at this stuff and they're really really politically savvy yeah and so they yeah, oh yeah. Karuk, yeah the karuk and the forest service are kind of yeah. on the klamath drainage um in siskiyou county mm. um humboldt county too i guess yeah they have started to create a partnership that is the closest thing to success i think but they're mm. burning hundreds of acres not millions and we would need millions it's got well this is the thing right it happens on a it starts anyway that that's how these sort of uh i i don't want to argue that it shouldn't be that the tribe is is doing it but i when you're when you're talking about the scale like that's what these sort of kind of public image facing priority projects start with is like a relatively small amount um and yeah, I mean, I mean, I think about this often in terms of like community, like like land ownership and community land, and you know, uh, the potential of that type of solution in conservation when we're only ever getting to see it on these really small scales, right? Mm -hmm. And and how we can go forward and know if that works or not is really difficult. Mm -hmm. And so know. I'm asking about this because. I want to set up a kind of basic conflict here where there is, mm. um, you quote someone uh, in your book, and I, I don't have his name here, but you quote someone in your book um, talking about how environmental policy in the West often gets, you know, made or advocated for by urbanites who act more out of a sense of guilt than they do out of connection to nature. Um, yeah. And that often has a lot to do with a kind of idea that we wall nature off, we preserve it from people. Um, and that yeah. is the best way to conserve things. Uh, mm -hmm. And then in the West, whether you're the tribes, whether you're the rednecks, whether you are somebody who lives and makes their Ranchers, work on the land, you know. all these sorts of people, yeah. you have a much more nuanced and complicated view of these things. Yes. Um, and these Absolutely. are the basic dividing lines that create a lot of the conflicts in the West over ecology, mm -hmm. over resource extraction, over all this kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. with all of that in mind, let's now go sort of towards the start of your book. Um, and I was wondering sure. if you could give us a little sketch of the logging wars, um, which I say yeah. to distinguish them from the timber wars in BC, maybe the logging wars in, in yeah. California and give an idea of how that. Oh, see, I've. Sure. Um, and so they uh, up here, they called them war in the woods. I always thought it was mm. timber wars in the Pacific Northwest, but I may have misunderstood that. You know what? Um, Actually, I could be wrong now. So let's, no. let, let's talk about- In any Pacific case, Northwest. there was yeah. there was war, <laughs> you know? Um, so I I think you've really, you've really set it up well. Um, I, uh, you know, I heard about tree poaching about a decade ago. I heard about a tree that was stolen. Uh, it was a cedar. 
And at the time I, uh, it was old growth cedar too, mm-hmm. and it was in boundaries of park. And at the time I was a really kind of focused on magazines and I thought, well, this is going to be a great magazine feature. And I, you know, I reached out to the park service up here and I reached out to uh, kind of investigators and I was looking into kind of how I might be able to frame this story. I thought, oh, it's, you know, environment, but it's true crime and we'll Mm -hmm. follow them. And that very quickly went away because the investigators and the park wardens were saying, what we're probably never going to find these people. Like it's so rare. This happens so often and it's so rare and and we report it out and we do the best we can but you know it's already too i think you know a week later they were saying it's already too late and so at the same time they were saying you know this is a crime that happens all the time and it's poaching and there's all sorts of reasons that go into it they were telling me that you know this is linked to meth this is linked to poverty in these small communities often where poachers live um and I kind of fell down a rabbit hole first in terms of reading about poaching history, um, which, you know, again, I think I had approached with a sort of, I had not really kind of dug into conservation history at that point. And so, you know, I didn't have a very nuanced look at it. And and I soon realized that this was a crime that was just um, like really malleable, quite fluid. Um, I, I I started learning about the history of enclosures and how, uh, you know, poaching was a kind of a crime that I had always known as a crime, but really was based in the fact that like the commons had been removed from use. You know, uh, wait, you know let me stop you there. Cause actually yeah. that's a history that a lot of people don't know. And that I should have asked. Sure. About. So, oh yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me try to frame that question really quick for people who aren't sure. up on sort of you know 13th century British history um but Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) like a lot of our public lands our conception of what public lands are trace in a certain way towards like directly back to um the the British conception of commons and commonly held forests commonly held rangelands etc um and you know a lot more about this stuff than I do but I think it'll be really interesting to our agroecology types and stuff like that yeah I maybe I think so too yeah sure I mean this is anyway this is part of why I love the conversations on this podcast so um you know I start the book and I'm talking about something called a verderer's court and a verderer's court was uh, you know, I think it was 16th century England, and then it was a place where people that committed crimes against the forest went to be kind of tried. Um, and this was because, you know, it sprung up because so many forests had been essentially established. I don't think we often think of forests the same way that they used to be thought of historically. Um, and so really, uh, you know, I say, I write in the book that they share a uh, uh, a root word with the word forbidden huh. you know a forest a- around this time would have been like it could have been a crofter's field and it could you know sometimes it was an entire rural town uh it could be include rivers lakes mountains all of this um and it was um a place that royalty uh the monarchy and you know the powerful around them clergy etc where they they uh, removed it from public common use and they they preserved it for hunting only um, and so you know that often meant uh, that they would hire at the time gamekeepers or sheriffs that would patrol the boundaries of these forests often at night uh, looking for poachers because what happened at that time was as you can imagine a lot of people that were that worked the land for a living which was basically everyone Mm -hmm. uh were very angry about this being taken away and that you know an activity that they had done for subsistence and for kind of very low levels of money um but that but that kind of operated their community and was part of community life uh had been made illegal and so you know you get all these stories of folks kind of going in under the dark of night they often painted their faces black with coal so that they couldn't be seen and they would snare rabbits and sometimes they would poach things and not you know kind of as a as a as a warning you know so they would leave stag's blood 
hanging around and often they would take wood uh, because wood from the common was used for all sorts of economic and personal reasons. You know, it would be, you know, primarily firewood. But in the in the instance that I'm talking about in the Verdurer's court, you know, the, the documents say someone is being charged with taking wood because they were using it to brew beer. Mm -hmm. uh, or they were baking bread for their company, you know, their small business. Their small so, so just to dead. stop you here. So when when we yeah. talk about crimes against the forest at this time, mm -hmm. what we're fundamentally talking about is crimes against the property of powerful people. Indeed. Yeah, exactly that. Yeah, it's uh, removed from common use and, and, and turned into in, in that instant becomes private property. Right. right? So in, in a to, just to jump ahead like radically mm -hmm. in time. Yeah. One of one of the great sort of conflicts in the conception of public lands in the American West today is when I do something for my own private use on public lands, is that a crime against nature or is it a crime against the powerful government and governmental interests that have cut nature mm -hmm. off from me and my community? Yes. Um, and so that question still persists today. And I we're going to talk about that. It really does. Uh Anyway, yeah, we can, when we jump forward, you know, poachers that I interviewed today, uh, because I was, you know, lucky enough to, that I was kind of welcomed by, by some people who poach, um, you know, they were committing a crime against the federal government as right. they see it, or against the park service, which is a agency of the federal government. Um, and the real tricky thing that, um, again, if you live in the East, it may be hard to see how this plays out, but for environmentalists in the American West, traditionally, crimes against the federal government are proxies for crimes against the environment. But yeah. sometimes that yeah. story is muddier than it would first appear. And that's sort of mm -hmm. the, the space in which your book is operating. So I think that that's why I personally was super interested in it. Um, yeah, I think, um, you know, I think, and I, I try to do this a little bit in the book, but a lot of that anger that, you know, that I talk about that the commoners were having in, in sort of 16th century England that really was you know you hear echoes of that now you hear the exact same mm -hmm. uh, you know the language is maybe a bit different but you're hearing the same frustrations the same resentments the even the rangers like you know I I was uh, really again quite lucky to be able to spend time with park rangers and they're saying the exact same things to me as I was reading in the historical record or the historical books that I was reading and so that that history of conservation essentially continues, right? So, uh, when when the king is saying we're conserving this land for the health of the deer that I hunt and the woods that I'm going to sell or the woods that I want to keep around because the deer that I hunt live in them, um, you know, there's not a lot of divide and understanding between that and we're going to conserve these old growth forests for a spotted owl. Mm -hmm. Essentially. Yeah. So let's talk about um, just quick capsule history here, um, like mm -hmm. just to get us up to the logging wars. So basically, um, mm -hmm. let's say under Taft, I guess, uh, you started <laughs> in order to preserve watersheds in the West and to keep like literal mountain slides from crashing into yep. Denver and Los Angeles. You started creating these things called yep. forest reserves with, with which in with which have a very interesting parallel in terminology to the ways that forests were conserved from the commons back mm -hmm. in the old country. Uh, so you started creating these national forest reserves. And then under Roosevelt and Gifford Pinchot, those were formalized into a more, like into an actual agency known as the United States Forest Service. They were greatly expanded. Mm -hmm. And most of the West now, I'm not sure the exact number, but most of the American West now is either managed by the Forest Service, the Park Service, or the Bureau of Land Management, which covers yeah. sort of deserts and less desirable places, frankly, um, <laughs> in, in, in many cases. Uh, we That's like not them. on their official website. Yeah, yeah they don't. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, I think an unofficial motto is we manage the lands nobody wanted. Um, yeah, yeah. But um, so all that all that to say that the forest reserves before the, that foundation were just sort of generalized, common, free range public land. There was not mm -hmm. a big drawn boundary that said this is public, this isn't public. Um, 
and all of a sudden I mean, some land yes you're right i mean i suppose some land was privately owned right um, sure i just mean that was different the federal commons was actually a federal okay commons. Yeah. Um, yes. And that changed very, very rapidly over the course of the early 20th century. And yes. in the course of the second half of the 20th century, uh, we started to have to deal with the consequences of that um, because people were really using those public lands very heavily. Um, and the agency, yeah. to a large degree, encouraged that and they facilitated it. Uh, and in the course of this discussion, we'll be talking about the Forest Service and the Park Service. Um, yeah. But the Forest Service itself, you know, was in large part bought and sold by loggers and they existed to help get board feet off those lands. Uh, yes. That began to change um, with the rise of the environmental movement in the 60s and 70s. And this precipitated whatever we're calling it, the timber wars, the logging wars. Mm -hmm. So maybe get us up to yeah. speed what happened there in the Pacific Northwest. Sure. Sure. So, I mean, like you're saying, um, you know, in the second half of the 20th, 20th century, um, there was, there was like heavy use on these federal lands, these federal agency lands. And part of that actually was that, you know, following, there were, there are a few social reasons, uh, which is that following the second world war, there was like a real push to, uh, to log heavily to like build homes, right? It was like part of the recovery effort. Wood was seen as like part of the the necessity to get the country going again. Um, and logging as part of that was seen as like you are helping the country when you are a logger. Um, also technology had advanced and would continue to advance to a stage where it became really easy to start cutting down lots of trees in one go um, in, a, in a scale that really just hadn't been seen until then you know it wasn't you see these iconic photos of men all standing by redwood and you realize like that was their job for quite some time and then eventually you could take down these old growth redwoods really really quickly um and so you're right that led to kind of the the kind of expansion of the environmental movement uh and in the pacific northwest part of the the kind of push to slow the amount of logging that was happening on forest service lands was legal in nature, um, and it included listing the uh, northern spotted owl. And I believe in, in British Columbia, though I'm not sure uh, you can correct me further across the border, uh, the marbled murrelet mm -hmm. uh, as endangered species. And what, the, what that would mean is that any company, any logger who spotted one of these birds during operations in a in a cut block or you know in a in a sort of allocated logging area if if it was spotted they would have to stop work and an environmental assessment would come in and you know it'd be determined if this was habitat for these birds that were endangered and and um like kind of quite sensitive to the forest around them um, and in a lot of ways that that did lead to there was already, to be honest, a, a decrease in logging happening due to just economic pressures. But then this was a this was like a big legislative win on the environmental side to list these birds as as endangered species. Um, and it really kicked off like, I mean, they say a war and, you know, physically it wasn't, uh, you know, you weren't having like casualties in that way, but it was quite violent, uh, you know, particularly in the forest. Um, there were stories of loggers running after environmentalists with axes and chainsaws and, you know, people's families were being threatened uh, at the people same lying, time. People lying down the in front of dancers. People lying, exactly, chaining themselves to uh, to machinery that was like, you know, really quite dangerous. This is when you get these kind of iconic ideas of people living in the treetops and having tree sits and, and really being up there for, you know, I think this woman, Julia Butterfly Hill, she was up there for a year, you know, she mm -hmm. was up there for quite a long mm -hmm. time. Um, and the rhetoric, like the rhetoric was extremely polarizing. Yeah. Um, and so you've got environmentalists who were arguing and and you know placing op-eds and and going on the radio and saying that loggers were like murderers and rapists of the forest and and using this like really harsh conjecture i have um, a photo i have a photo somewhere yeah. i'm dying to find it because i want to put it in my book but i have a photo 
And let's cut away and actually talk about the 70s. Sure. Yeah, that. I'd love something. to talk about that. But I, yeah. I have a photo from um, a thing that I believe we'll talk about where they took a wooden peanut uh, to um, appeal to Jimmy Carter. Yeah. Uh, to to yeah, keep that's a, that's an um, but the photo the photo is of a guy holding up a sign that says loggers lives matter in the seventh. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah, so I always think about yes, that. indeed. Um, uh, everything old is new again, or whatever. Yeah. But uh, and also that was a con- and I write about that in the book. And um, James, I'm sure you you know about this, but that was a convoy as well, a trucking yes. convoy, and in Canada that just took over our country for six months this year. So anyway, I was watching this thinking, oh my God. (laughs) (laughs) Um, I mean, I'm really, really interested in the Canadian truckers. uh, So I would have to refer to that to talk for an hour. But um, let's let's actually talk about, see, I consider this part of the logging wars. Maybe this is just a fake rubric I developed in my head. No. Uh, Mm -hmm. But let's Mm -hmm. talk about specifically Redwood country, which in the 1970s and 80s, before Spotted Owl came in and really blew everything up like on a basically national scale honestly yeah before that the area your book is set in um the redwood country Mm -hmm. california oregon etc was the real dead center for a war between frequently bay area environmentalists Mm -hmm. and locals yeah uh over how much and and whether or not to love redwoods um Okay. Yes. And I mean, it's also, you know, it was a, even way before then, it was the epicenter of like a certain amount of activism, right? So Save yes. the Redwoods League, which is um, like iconic, and even people that have never been to the Redwoods know that name. I mean, that that started in the early 20th century, and it continues now with its influence. Um, and it is highly Bay Area based. You yeah. Know? I mean, um, and even, and this I is, mean, I hate to say it, but like, yeah, I mean, there there is a degree to which, you know, that whole kind of bohemian grove thing like the the real like sort mm-hmm. of california masters of the universe were very heavily involved in i mean in specifically redwood conservation specifically redwood yes. conservation has often yeah. brought together extremely powerful and influential people particularly in california in the bay area so that mm-hmm. colors a lot of like what was to come um i'm not suggesting yeah absolutely there's a globalist pop, pop yeah and I... redwoods, but yeah <laughs> Yeah. And um, I mean, when we're talking about the 80s, late 70s, the 80s, you know, you're also dealing with um, smaller logging firms that were that may have been owned by local families that got kind of, um, you know, uh, taken over or or bought out or whatever by these like really huge global logging firms. And they're, you know, we're we're talking about NAFTA and, and kind of uh ship like shipping of manufacturing jobs overseas and and even though the harvesting was happening in California you know the the, the work around the trees that that ancillary work uh, was not happening there anymore so there's all these sorts of things that are going on at the time where uh communities are were were in turmoil you know like they were seeing their jobs change and you know I write in the book that a lot of particularly men it's like a very highly male uh, industry for for probably obvious reasons of what the work looks like um you know they'd been they'd been conditioned that this was their dad's job their grandfather's job and it would be their job and so that might sound a little bit like um uh entitlement but it also was the reality uh on the ground and so when you've got in the 80s or you know 70s and 80s all of this activism around stopping that work it it was just it kind of turned into into quite a personal emotional battle in northern california and i think the best way um, to especially in the that, town of oric you know yeah let me let me yeah. let me um just stop you there because i think people sure. would be interested in this yeah um can can you tell us about what i think is probably the best symbol of that which is the lo- the logger convoy to dc yes yeah, uh, for sure. So actually, the um, the way that this came about was uh, that a uh, a company had had uh, no. I'm sorry. Let me go back in my brain. So the way that this convoy had been kind of sparked was that in 1968, Redwood National Park is uh, instated, uh, but due to kind of like intense negotiations around what would become the park and what wouldn't. 
and you know which parts of the state park would become part of the national park and all of this sort of difficult chess playing. Uh, there was a lot of uh, uh, activism around also including the Redwood, am I right in this, the Redwood Creek watershed? No, I think that came later. That was the Charles Corwin thing. Was that later? I, I, okay. I believe, um, so, and we'll get to that, th- actually. Yeah. I should have freshened up, so I apologize. But um, in 1978, uh, you know, the, the Carter administration expanded the park. Um, and again, this took more sort of logging concessions out of use. Uh, you know, the, the logging towns around Redwood National Park were quite angry about this, including the town of Oric, which is where much of my reporting takes place. And a lot of former loggers or, you know, working loggers at that time banded together. They decided that they were going to do a big logging truck convoy to Washington, D.C., and that they were going to deliver to Capitol Hill a chunk of redwood that had been carved into the shape of a peanut as a sort of commentary to President Carter. And they had signs along the side of these convoys that say things like, you know, it's peanuts to you, it's jobs to us. Like you were saying, um, logging lives matter, uh, you know, all of this sort of, you know, they were doing PR along the way. So they were stopping in cities like Chicago and they were giving out redwood seedlings and they had all of these loggers kind of join in as they went. So you've got loggers from Washington and Oregon who, you know, presumably had seen that what affects logging in Northern California affects them too. Uh, and that this was, you know, could be very well be their own community. Mm-hmm. And so they've driven across the country and they arrive in Capitol Hill and they've got these huge, massive work trucks with them. And President Carter does not come out to accept the gift. He sends out two sort of uh, ranking associates or advisors to to talk to them. And they were quite angry about this, you know, like they uh, I interviewed a someone who was part of this convoy who said that when he drove home, he like he was like mad as hell that nobody had that the president hadn't come out and accepted their gift. I, you know, I think it was very unlikely that the president would do it in the first place. But of course, like that's with hindsight. And they just they drove all the way back home and that that peanut it lives in Oric outside yeah. the gas station now. Yeah. You know, um, it I, is, I but it's part that. of. Yeah. Um, and it's part of the town's lore. When you go into that gas station, the walls are just covered with like a commemorative commemorative calendar that they had made of this it was called the talk to america convoy Mm -hmm. uh because you know the goal had been that they would stop and talk to people along the way and and you know advocate for their logging work and you know advocate essentially against the park and you know expansion um, but uh yeah i would just say this story it's the layers and complexity of it um between (laughs) you know hey these old growth stands were getting way overlogged and it was a huge yeah. problem, but also it was devastating to communities. And also the people who were getting hurt were the communities. And also yeah. the solutions that they had were not necessarily beneficial for the wider ecosystems anyway. And so the whole thing is mm-hmm. like sort of, it's very emotionally wrenching and the sort of the scene of the truckers leaving, like dejected, having been rejected by this president who they thought might be on their side as a guy who yeah. literally himself also works off the land has always been very touching yeah. to me. And I think um, yeah. Lindsay does a great job of telling the story in the book and it's very touching. Uh, so yeah, it's a good reason you. to pick it up. Quick other history thing and let's get into the tree thieving. Um, but <laughs> there's, there's a really important sort of detail uh, that comes I think right before this convoy or maybe right after it. And I, uh, blah, blah, blah. I'm not sure, but there's a fellow named Charles Hurwitz. Yes. um, And that was uh, right after the convoy. So Charles Hurwitz was in the eighties. And he was a hedge fund, hedge fund, a hedge fund manager from Houston, which I did not find surprising. (laughs) When I when I was first learning about him, and he bought Pacific Lumber Company uh, on a steal, uh, simply to gut it, and uh, you know, basically short his own company, I suppose. Uh, get get the 
get the uh, proceeds out of the remaining redwoods and get the hell out. Uh, and so he, uh, when this happened, it was devastating to the whole, to the whole county, to the all of Humboldt County, uh, because so many people had been, had had people in their lives employed by PL, you know, they'll just call it PL there. Mm -hmm. um, and he, he went in, you know, there's, there's quite a, famous picture of him standing with I believe one of his sons or maybe one of his brothers just looking at like a vast clear cut in front of him and saying like this is exactly what I wanted I wanted to cut as much of this last remaining old growth as I can and liquidate the company mm -hmm. um and so as you can imagine this was just a huge galvanizing moment for for the environmental movement in in Humboldt County and you know, I am sensitive to that because this really was not sustainable harvest at all. And it wasn't sustainable even for, obviously for the employees, there were employees that worked for the company at the time that didn't, that knew that what was happening was wrong and did not want to be doing that type of work. But, you know, the market had, had decided that, you know, essentially that this was what had to be done. Um, well, and, and let me, let me jump in right yeah. there too, because and this is where things, as they often can in the West, get really tricky, um, as they often mm -hmm. can in American land policy in general. The Hurwitz game, as far as I understand it, was not just, I'm going to like rape this land for all it's worth and then blast out. It was that mm -hmm. by destroying as much land as possible, he incentivized further the federal government to then come in and pay him to stop. And so he went in highly mm -hmm. leveraged with bank money, no connection to this land, no connection to these people, oh, God, these God, people no. to yeah. destroy the land. And then the federal government bought him out mm -hmm. of hundreds of millions of dollars and he left a rich man. Yeah. And so yeah. it's really. He did. And I believe that one of his, one of his business advisors went to, went to jail for some sort of fraud. I, I, I suspect it wasn't related to Humboldt, but. Yeah. Um, Cause you don't even do you, need, to, do you, you know don't need to story? commit a crime to commit that kind of crime. That's the scary, yeah. you know? <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. And just very, very quick capsule history because. Yeah. Thank you. I've talked about this before on this podcast, but mm -hmm. something slightly similar, less, less insidious, but a similar process has played out in logging communities across the West. So mm -hmm. in the place where I've been living, a guy named Red Emerson, who was the founder of Sierra Pacific Industries, he actively encouraged the spotted owl deals that basically shut down all the small time loggers because that allowed him to achieve a monopoly and then to yeah. do all the kind of the stuff that fit in with the larger processes that were transforming American economy in general, such as like industrialization, mm -hmm. mechanization, breaking unions. Yeah. He was able to oh, break yeah. all the unions, shut down all the small mills, and basically make it impossible to have a small-time public lands logging industry in that mm -hmm. area because he was the only yeah. player in town. And he could, like Horowitz did, uh, he could raise money from eastern banks to buy private ground, turn those into plantations. Yeah. And now you can't really log anything because even if it yeah. was possible... Like, even if it was legally and regulatorily possible to log in this area, there's no mill capacity because everybody's shut mm -hmm. down. Yeah. So you can't do the thinning projects. You can't do the fire projects. You can't basically try to prevent these fires. Um, yeah. And I've talked about that at the length of an hour on here before. So that's all. But <laughs> these things. Well, no, thank things. you for that, because I uh, anyway, I, I didn't uh, delve too deeply into all of that stuff just because eventually I had to remember that I was writing about poaching but um right. <laughs> I really appreciate all of that context um no so this is a perfect anyway and I could yeah. really yeah, part of what I could talk about with the poaching is just how good some of these private corporations were at I want to say internal communications internal PR in mm -hmm. in essentially hiding or glossing over or, you know, not being as open with their employees about what was happening. You know, I think that, you know, you talk about union busting and I think this, that is a, like a really actually big deal uh, that, that really deprived a lot of the communities um, that I've, that I've written about and that I've done interviews in because <clears throat> I just felt, I mean, I know that this shouldn't be a surprise, but, you know, I just felt in the end that, um, a lot of workers had been screwed over by their companies who just essentially 
did not have their workers in mind. The mm-hmm. unions had been busted and these were the people on their sides. And it's a lot easier to be, you know, just yelling uh, in service of the people that have paid you against environmentalists rather than looking at it at it and saying, well, where's my union? Why does my company not care if I don't have job, have work in a year? You mm-hmm. know? And, um, and that, that was is a really, big takeaway for me. Yeah, that is a really key point because, um, uh, you know, and it wasn't all of them, of course, but no. a lot of the unions, mm-hmm. a lot of the unions in this part of the world were voices saying, hey, if we keep cutting like this, we're going to have to go away. This is going to end yes. badly for our workers. Um, and yes. that was, and unionized mills were, you know, they were voices of that. Uh, and you know, when that started to go away, you lost a counterweight, you lost a counterweight and it became you did. a kind yeah. of polarized enviros versus the companies kind of thing. And, and people were forced to choose. Yeah. Um, yeah. A hundred percent. Like you didn't have essentially any, uh, any voice in there that was, that had the workers perspective, right. It was consumerism or like corporate consumerism only environmentalism only. And, and you know, any, even if like, this is where I, I tend to get quite critical about environmentalism, because I think it was their job to really come a bit more towards what the unions in the history in the past had done. And they just didn't, you know, they've, they have found that and continue to find that very difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so that's a perfect transition actually here. <laughs> um, so let's maybe for people who have not spent a lot of time in rural Humboldt County, um, and- <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And or indeed, like if they, you know, if their vision of Humboldt County is Arcata or or Eureka. Yeah. Arcata? Arcata? Mm-hmm. I always get that wrong. I've always um, said Arcata, but I, yeah, might, it's I, Arcata. Might have it wrong. I don't know why I just uh, said that. Yeah. But so the town you're focused on, uh, I have been to, but I don't know a ton about. It's called Oren. Mm-hmm. Um, you want to give us a picture mm-hmm. of that? Like where it is, literally where yeah, it is, sure. et cetera. Yeah. For sure. So if you're looking at a map of Humboldt, uh, and you see sort of where the Redwoods National Park is at the at the tip of the of the county there, of the northern part of the county. Oric is right on the southern tip. So the Southern Operations Center is based out of this town. You have to drive through the town to get to the park. Uh, it is, you know, kind of along Redwood Creek and borders on on the on the west side, the Pacific Ocean. So it's a really small town. It it has kind of a large uh, plain right before you hit the hit the ocean uh, where you know there used to be quite a big dairy industry around here where people had grazed dairy cows and things like that um and it was a logging town until the park came in so there were there were mills around it and this was the town that people lived in uh, the the highway was developed to go right through it and when you look at these, these sort of old you know, mid 20th century photos of the town there's always like a big truck (laughs) going Mm -hmm. right through town um and you know i think at at its at its prime it had probably about 2,000 people right now it has less than 200 um and it's uh you know it's i don't know if this would be familiar to listeners but it is to me but uh you know it's one of those towns that builds up along the side of the road so it's quite uh you know it doesn't go inland very far and you've got houses that kind of branch off from businesses that face out towards the highway Mm -hmm. you've got like a cafe that's no longer open a gas station um, a restaurant there's an old hardware store that is open but doesn't really sell hardware (laughs) Mm -hmm. um and then you've got houses that are kind of like built out more uh, around those uh, but still quite a quite a small town Um, and then right the minute you get through it's yeah exactly the minute you're you're through the town there's just redwoods national park all around you you know you're going through stands of kind of these iconic images that you've seen before of these really massive trees and just so people know just just kind of give people an idea of this area it's when we talk about Mm -hmm. creeks in humboldt county like even that is like a little different than you might think like they're these weird aquamarine Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> like they don't have a lot of gradient. There's not a lot of flow. They, they aren't your your Montana Western freestone streams. They're they're tidal. No, thank you for that actually. Um, yeah. I had to uh, I had to water. learn that. Yeah. Myself. And they, they're yeah, fully... sorry, do you want to say that again? Oh, sorry. Uh, they they're just these things that 
they're really, really incredible. They're worth just like Googling. But the pools, the pools are aquamarine um, and at low water, um, the pools will even separate. And then you get these mm -hmm. um, coastal salmonids, um, you know, in the Eel River, you have salmon and and steelhead that will run up in a place like redwood creek you have coastal cutthroat trout that run up yeah. um yeah. and that will choose they're very flexible they'll choose based on water conditions they're going to go in they're going to go out yeah it's a really really unique environment um mm -hmm. redwood country is unlike anything in all the rest of the west and all the rest of the world in a lot of ways um mm -hmm. the trees are bigger uh the landscape is steeper um yeah. the floods are crazy and so this is not it's kind of hard to tell because there aren't tons of rocky outcroppings. There aren't tons of year long raging rivers, but it's incredibly rugged and it's incredibly steep. And the canyons are just as steep as they are in Utah. Yeah. And so it's a very rural, wild kind of area, even though it doesn't, it looks sort of soft and almost Eastern from the sky. When people started poaching, do we have an idea of when this happened and why it started to become a thing? So, I mean, as poachers were, were very keen to tell me, I mean, there isn't really like a known start date because poaching is this like traditional practice in a sense. It's been going on forever, you know, since something, be since boundaries were placed upon them, right. people have been taking wood. Um, and so, you know, um, I was at the Humboldt Historical Society one day, I was just doing research and uh, there was a fella in there who told me, oh yeah, my dad used to poach my grandpa taught him how to like cut a burl off. And, and I think that this is a really, um, important part actually just to add in is that in, in the poachers that I talk about in the book in Humboldt County, they are poaching burls off the side of Redwood most, most often. And a burl is this kind of growth on the side of a tree. It's covered in bark. It looks like a big stomach usually. Um, often with redwoods, it's near the base of the tree, but it can be it can be way higher up. I mean, if you've ever noticed a Douglas fir uh, that has a big bump like halfway up the tree, that is a burl. And the wood on the inside is just really beautiful. Um, and it's often has this very unique grain and you can you can easily spin it into uh, a, like a really beautiful bowl. If the slab, like if the burl is big enough, you can get a table out of it. You can get all sorts of furniture and art. And so this was the, this was a driving factor, uh, you know, behind the poaching. And it's also what people were telling me was like a traditional practice. Somebody also told me that they had a burl tree in their backyard where <laughs> there were so many burls on it that they would go out and like cut a tree off, cut or sorry, cut a burl off, cut a burl off. So, mm -hmm. um, so the what, activity what forms a burl. What? what uh, yeah. Form? So it's interesting. Usually they are formed as a sort of response to trauma. Mm -hmm. um, so if something happens to a redwood uh, that threatens its life, often it will concentrate on forming a burl, and that's because the burl has a lot of its genetic knowledge and adaptation in it. Um, a burl can survive a forest fire or a flood, and it can lead to new growth coming up around it. So it's kind of a, a safeguard in a way, you know, it's, it's, it's a tree saying, okay, I might not live forever, but I'm going to put my, my evolution mm -hmm. uh, and my, and my genetics into this thing that's going to lead to more of me coming up mm -hmm. future old growth essentially. There is a lot of debate around this, uh, not not so much around what burls do, but um, how important they are. Um, and, you know, it was very common for poachers and loggers to tell me that burls were valuable and that they also were meant nothing to the tree. You know, I think somebody told me that they're actually a cancer on the tree, so I'm doing the tree a favor and scientists would disagree with that, but we also don't have a lot of research that's been done over a very long period of time to know what happens when a tree when a tree has its burl taken. So it's a little bit of a gray area there. Mm -hmm. There's a bit of that, presumption happening. Yeah, that's how sides. You know, redwoods are sort of masters. As far as trees go, I mean, redwoods are the kings of asexual repro yes. reproduction. They're, yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. They can sprout from a lot of different things. They can sprout from these burls. They can sprout mm -hmm. from stumps. You have this conversation in these areas where people are like, well, who cares if we cut them? Look at how fast they sprout. That can go a little far. So that, that colors some of this stuff. Give us a sense, though, of like numbers. Like when when somebody, sure. what, what is a burl worth to me? 
Sure. Um, so, uh, you know, in one instance, somebody took a, you know, a poacher took a burl into a burl shop, which are these, again, these kind of culturally in a way unique uh, artisan shops that line the highway again, you know, often seen in Southern Oregon and in Northern California. And, you know, sometimes an artisan works in them and does work and sometimes they, uh, they sell to, to uh, other, other people that are going to make the table of the bowl or what have you. Um, and so, you know, I would say that, uh, you know, in one case, a burl, quite a large number of burl slabs were sold to a shop that was selling them for about $1,400 each. So not an insignificant mm -hmm. amount of money. A bowl can go for all sorts of things, you know, $150 to $30, like just all over the map. Um, in general, uh, when a poacher is removing a burl from a tree, they're often cutting it into blocks and then transporting those blocks in through the back of a vehicle to a burl shop. And so those blocks, you know, they can vary in price. Usually they are going for, usually the poacher will sell them for like maybe $700 for a pretty good one. Uh, so not a lot, but they can be flipped and sold for quite a profit uh, so from the burl shop itself. So, okay. So with that in mind, I mean, this is kind of, this is kind of like one of the funny things in the book, darkly funny in a certain way, is that mm -hmm. you have this whole poaching economy. And to be clear, like if you straight up, and I don't think you hung out with anybody who was doing this, but if you straight up are stealing trees, these trees are worth a lot of money. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. For sure. Um, so I do, um, I do talk about a couple of cases where whole trees, like it's more common for trees like maple and Douglas fir mm -hmm. to be poached whole. I will say that there are some instances of redwoods being poached, but it's, it's very rare and they were never found. So I have no idea how much the, uh, the wood went for, mm -hmm. uh, but like a Douglas fir, if you're selling it to a mill, if you can find a mill, that's going to take it. No questions asked. Like, you know, upwards of 10, 10 grand yeah. for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, but so sort of the funny thing here is that the people you're talking to are people who are playing for much lower stakes. That's exactly it. So I, you know, I think at first, anyway, I've, I've had to catch myself a few times because I've said like, oh, well, that's not that much money, but you know what, like for the, for, for people in poverty, $700 is a, is a solid chunk, you know? Um, so, and for the amount of work that goes into it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Tell us about, I'll actually let you pick, but tell us about sure. one of the characters and sort of how they get into it and what they're doing, mm -hmm. how they're hiding from the, you know, the Rangers, like give us, yeah. give us a sketch of the job. Sure. Well, actually, and I, I just want to go back briefly because you, you had asked me about scale. And so this kind of leads into, into right. that, um, in between 2013, no, between 2014 and 2015, there were so many burl poaching cases in Redwoods that the Redwoods National Park actually embarked on this huge study where they, you know, they were mapping out kind of where each case was happening. They brought in researchers from Southern California who had LIDAR technology, which is this sort of um, uh, laser technology that can that can map the tree cover um and you know they were really trying to pinpoint like what trees were being targeted and why and they were trying to get a sense of patterns and so within that that in between 2014 did i say 2014 2015 yes right? i think so between that between 2014 and 2017 there were a hundred poaching cases which is not insignificant over like wow. a three-year span and so there was a there was a pretty high profile case around that time, and that was the case of Danny Garcia. And um, I, I speak to Danny in the book, but actually, um, I think I'd like to to talk a little bit and hear about Derek Hughes. Um, yeah. So Derek's case uh, took place 2018 through 2019, 2020, 2021. It was quite a prolonged legal case there. Um, and he was he was caught on camera. Um, you know, the, the Park Service utilizes hidden cameras in trees in the park. Uh, uh, and he was he was caught poaching burl from a stump. So you were saying that uh, that new redwoods sprout from stumps. And that's that that's exactly this case of 
kind of why it was so important that the poaching happened from an already logged tree. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it was him and, and one other sort of unnamed person uh, who went in around midnight into Redwoods National Park, not far at all from the main highway. They just pulled off onto like a little uh, little landing. You know, I think we can all kind of envision that, how sometimes you can see where the road curves in and there's a there's a landing. And he and he poached over, you know, over a number of days, quite a bit of wood um, out of this out of this part of the park. He uh, he cut burl out of a out of a stump that was kind of up quite like you said, quite a steep hill. And he tumbled that wood down the hill to the base where his truck was parked and loaded it into the back. Um, And that wood was not, you know, it was cut into into, uh, blocks. Um, It was not sold right away, actually. He he kept it on his various kind of parts of his property. And uh, later when when his uh, when the wood had been seized and when the his laptop and other sort of digital company and <laughs> accoutrements or whatever received, uh, they found that he had been actually trying to to offload some of the wood to a flute dealer, uh, which is quite interesting. Uh, you know, there's a quite a market for musical instrument wood that is poached. Right. But Derek, you know, they the pictures that they had of him were not, you know, they were they were they were dark. They 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 thought it was him. They thought it looked like it was him. But they had to do a fair amount of work, uh, basically cultivating local informants to try and create a um, to create a case against him. And and so it was really interesting because they his case included all of these sorts of investigatory elements um, that led to his. That led to his conviction at the same, you know, Derek did speak to me quite a bit. And so at the same time, I was hearing sort of about his backstory and about his family who had moved to Oric from from Sacramento and how, you know, he moved to Oric and there were so many sorts of like loggers kids around him that he learned how to use a chainsaw. And there's a network of 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 men in Oric that poach wood and he had fallen in with this network. Um, He, he felt that, you know, it was really hard for him to find work for various reasons. He, um, you know, he has uh, been diagnosed with ADHD and, you know, he, uh, he, he did not graduate high school, but he, you know, he found it hard to enter sort of the traditional workforce, I suppose. And was he, and remind me, he was the one who was also, open with you about his meth use yeah and yes he was um so uh you know meth is a big part of this story it, it was introduced to me through an investigator who said you know frankly we have a meth problem in the pacific northwest and meth people that do meth are stealing trees and Mm-hmm. Um, I, you know, I think again, in my early days, I was surprised about that, but now that I know so much about like the history of the region and, and, and also sort of the meth epidemic that, that kind of rips through rural areas, it, it's not surprising to me anymore. Um, well, and so, um, you know, Derek, yeah. So the thing just, it's a very kind of crazy picture in a way, because this is a town I forget you, what the population was you said, but it's a very small it's town. It's just under 200. Yeah. yeah. So, and you have a network. Oop, there goes the dog. Um, yeah, sorry. <laughs> you have a network, <laughs> literally, of people in a town of 200. If you have a network of men whose job it is to poach wood, that's a significant, yes. that's by definition, a very significant portion of the town. And then yes. you have an investigation that's getting run out of a national park, which is mm-hmm in itself, like a very weird thing, I think, to a lot of people's ears. And it's very much this kind of conflict between enclosure and locals and things like this. Um, And I had a point to make about that, that I'm going to. Well, you know, I don't know if I can just jump in, but uh, there's a, there's a, um, there was, he has sadly passed, but a poaching expert uh, who, who, who kind of worked all over the world, his name was Rory Young, and he wrote a he wrote a handbook for for law enforcement, you know, that's that's mm-hmm. working kind of with anti-poaching measures. And he wrote in the book, in the handbook, um, the the problem of the sheriff of Nottingham was not Robin Hood. It was that the community was behind Robin Hood. Right. And this this has really stuck out to me as a sort of uh, guiding theme of this book. And so I wouldn't say that the people that I interviewed in Oric were were hiding 
the they actually came to be known this group of people they they mm -hmm. came to be known as the outlaws right um and it, i don't think that the community was was you know hiding them in their basements or anything like that but they were definitely knew who all of them were uh they were not always condemning of their actions mm -hmm. and they were always understanding right so they right. were always saying you know so and so does this because of his dad so and so does you know so and so is, has this anger in him because of you know what he sees the park has done to logging uh you know he hates the park or he you know he's down on his locker he uses meth and so he's part of that gang of the outlaws and um I, I thought this was all very interesting because when it comes time to investigate these poaching cases, that is the first place where rangers start is they start talking to local informants and trying to figure out who locally is willing to give information on a poacher. Mm -hmm. And and often that is what leads to, <laughs> to even the start of an investigation. Right. So, so and I mean... <sighs> Talk to me. So actually, I, I, I'll i flip this to an anecdote um, from my own reporting. Like I wrote a book about the Bundys and blah, blah, blah. And people always focus on Ammon mm -hmm. Bundy, and blah, blah. The thing about the thing about that story that I think often gets lost is that the main character for locals there was not Ammon Bundy or mm -hmm. even, even the individual actors who work for the government. It was the Malheur National Wildlife Refuge itself. Yeah. It was that entity. Yeah. And so the story with that is pretty similar in certain ways to Redwood National and State Park in yes. that it was a place where people went to go hunt feather birds for the feather trade, like big, big exotic mm -hmm. you know, sort of migrating um, aquatic birds uh, yeah. and people shot those birds to hell over the course. And in, I think, mm -hmm. 1916, something like that, yeah. they made it into a wildlife preserve to protect these like marshy saline lakes. And that was good. Everybody, nobody thinks that was a bad idea. The problem yeah. is that then the yeah. park takes on a life of its own. Because then the yep. park has its own sort of set of interests. And what would happen is you'd have one rancher a little down on his luck and the wildlife managers would come and say, hey, why don't you sell out to us? Because yep. then that person who was grazing his cows on refuge land, now he's gone. And now you're a little closer mm -hmm. to his neighbor and you keep yep. expanding. And people yes. started to view this federal entity this sort of line blob on a map as an enemy in their midst, even if they didn't necessarily hate the guys who are running it or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I feel like that is a thing that is really difficult for people who don't live near public lands necessarily understand. Yeah. And that this story well, shows really clearly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I think, um, and part of maybe the Redwoods flavor, like the unique thing about Redwoods is, uh, as compared as compared to the Malheur refuge is that a lot of again many of the poachers were saying to me like these these rangers are acting like cops mm -hmm. <laughs> and i actually i actually agreed i mean i'm from canada so i have a you know our law enforcement is a bit different but you know parks park rangers are not kind of what the what the stereotype is so you know of course there are people that work for parks who are rangers who do who do educational programs and they they mm -hmm. head out on the land and all of this but there's also a law enforcement aspect of this and the redwoods is actually one of the higher law enforcement parks mm -hmm. i suppose people transfer into there because they know that there's a lot of work to be done in redwoods mm -hmm. um and, you know, I, I was, again, the park service was so generous to me and I spent some days with Brandon Pirro, this ranger on the land, and he wears a bulletproof vest, he's got a gun, he's got a AR-15 in his truck, he, he's got radios, you know, and when they are investigating a case, they're going out into the community as law enforcement and mm -hmm. so this was a big part of this for me was that people were you know i'd be doing interviews with even with business owners saying well they're surveilling us they watch everything we do they they stick their nose in where it doesn't belong they th think they're cops this was like a really big you know theme mm -hmm. for me and i don't think that people that don't live there are going to get that 
nuance, yeah. right? Yeah. Of feeling like, why do they like they they watch our town as if we're all a bunch of crooks, you know? Um, <laughs> but that's really hard because, of course, people live in the town and they are they're criminals. So <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> it's kind of like this fulfilling circle yes. in a way. And then also at the same time, you know, you were talking about the the park expanding or sorry, the refuge expanding, and I think uh, in a similar way the the park service knows who might be down on their luck and you know they may they may not offer financial incentive but they certainly offer the incentive of i pulled you over mm-hmm. i noticed that there was meth in your vehicle if you do not want if you would like that ticket to disappear that charge to disappear do you know anything about mm-hmm. who's taking wood off the mm-hmm. land and mm-hmm. that is you know that is that is looking at at a local down on their luck and saying, how can I, how can I use this to my advantage? Absolutely. And, you know, so, so I'll reveal a little bit of my own weirdness with some of this stuff because mm. I get very conflicted because on the one hand, I'm like, stop taking trees. On the other hand, it is a, like, a <laughs> kind of wild, yeah. like for people who don't know, I mean, national parks have a lot more employees than per acre than national forests and stuff like that. There's a lot more people watching this area than than yeah. any other kind of public land, probably in all of America uh, per acre, yeah. unless it's like literally the Washington Monument. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, Redwood National and State Park, correct me if I'm wrong, but is I think 78,000 acres or something, right? It's yeah, not very it big. It's it, 78,000 no. acres is not big at all. No. no. And to, it's not as hard as people think to surveil very large portions of the West. People have done mm-hmm. it. People have done it long before there were cameras and this kind of thing. So yeah, it is a yeah. kind of crazy expression of like humans' ability to get away with things and to like operate outside of systems that people are even getting away with this while there's LIDAR and oh, yeah. trail cams and all this kind of thing. And it is on some level, like to my mind, it's hard not to look at as a little bit of a hopeful expression of the human spirit in a certain way you know well particularly because you actually really i mean i would never take away from these poachers like they know the land right right. like they know and they also know the um the shift schedules Mm -hmm. (laughs) of the rangers like there's a lot of knowledge that goes into it um you know i think and this this might be a good place to bring in uh the the kind of harvesting of wood off the beach uh this because of how redwood creek empties out often actually dead fallen redwoods or yeah dead fall will will flow down redwood creek empty out into the pacific ocean and then the tide will bring them back in onto the beach in auric and it right. it's like very common until relatively recently that families would go down there and harvest firewood off of this dead wood um i also think it's really important to to add that in james i know that you know this but i Actually, I've received a lot of like surprise from interviewers on this, but okay. in the Pacific Northwest, a lot of people use wood to heat their homes. You know, <laughs> it is especially if you are if you are living below the poverty line, but not even then. A lot of people just prefer it. And so firewood has this whole economy around it. And deadwood on the beach was part of this. And in 2000, uh, the park expanded its boundaries out three meters or 30 meters into the ocean. Therefore, you could not take the wood from the beach anymore. It was poaching. And this just caused massive uproar in the town because, again, here's an example of taking away of a common resource. People were saying, you're not even using this wood. It's going to pile up on the beach and cause all sorts of problems. And we use it for, you know, for Mm -hmm. heating, like it's already out of the park. And indeed, it did pile up on the beach and cause all sorts of problems like flooding onto ranch lands and things. Yeah. Um, and so this also fuels a lot of a lot of the poaching. And so Derek Hughes, you know, there's a quote from him in the book saying, if you had left well enough alone and allowed us to take the wood off the beach, I wouldn't go into the park. Like mm-hmm. I wouldn't go into the forest. And so. You know, that is where, you know, you're talking about your funny you know, your confliction around these things. Like I have real confliction around a lot of it. You can imagine writing a whole book, like my opinion changed all the time, but the, I find it really hard with the, with the B 
speech, you know, I don't know about the motive behind that and if right. it at all considered local economy. Well, let me ask you, actually, I mean, a kind of big picture question, and then maybe mm -hmm. let's shift to sort of the global policy side of your book sure. and, and all of this stuff. Uh, frankly, like, I, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. That's fine. That yeah. reads to me like a kind of thing that technocratic liberalism often does, where it's like, there's this weird unpoliced space of like people taking wood, and we can't really control it. And it seems like they should have a permit for it or something. And we don't mm -hmm. really know what to do. So we're just going to make it. You can't do it. Like you're just getting free yeah. wood from a kind of weird public space. And like you're literally yeah. in your home and living off of that. That's a thing yeah. that like there's a certain kind of person in this world who shapes our government has a lot of trouble with right now, you know, and, and like, it's something that, yeah. it's, you know, it's like, can you sell raw milk across state lines? Like, ah, no, <laughs> I don't think so. You shouldn't be able to, it's too weird. Yeah. And yeah, I read that. Is it because, kind of is it because people. like, do you think it's because it, it has like a sort of libertarian spirit to yeah, it, you know, and like, you're sort of also relying on people's, uh, like what I find kind of interesting about the firewood and the driftwood thing is that you didn't have the market did not take over in a sense people exactly. took what they needed and did not you know um i think that might confuse and scare a certain number of people i really think sure. that our society has trouble dealing with spaces where either markets mm -hmm. or some guy in a place issuing you a permit don't have control that feels mm -hmm. really weird to a certain kind of person yeah. in, this, in this world today. And, and actually that going, is exactly that thing. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's great. And and something that I didn't include in the book because I haven't like, I haven't done enough thinking about it, but um, there's a lot of sort of um, historical insight into, again, this, this back to the Verderer's court, back to the, mm -hmm. to the enclosures in the forests in England um, around sort of the idea of um let me think about how to word this just quickly. Um, like feeling threatened around the fact that uh, people were not always like ambitious, not always feeling the need to work mm -hmm. for money, but that, you know, that actually just harvesting what you need and calling it a day was absolutely yes. fine. And um, part of the later enclosures movement, particularly in the like early, because enclosures took a very long time. This was like a huge part of British history. And even in the early 19th century, this was going on. And, and part of the sort of PR push and the public push for like instating parks and, and, uh, you know, removing land from common use into other uses was that uh, folks who lived off the common land were slothful, mm -hmm. right? That they only did things when they needed to, they didn't work for the way that you think that you should work to to constantly be earning money and to pay for gas to heat your house rather than you know etc and i think that there's a little bit of that to this but i haven't really i haven't really explored it much but i just think it's interesting to think of you know the forest being a place that was once where people gathered and and took what they needed and was then commodified by being Mm -hmm. by being you know essentially taken away um anyway i think there's something there yeah you know i i mean there's definitely something there i mean it's a very socialist point of view so well, anyway. or indeed i mean it's a funny thing like is it socialist is it agrarian is it because mm. you know in the western united states the word slothful was historically often applied to to indians right and that, yeah. was, oh, that yeah. was the classic thing that was the classic thing they're slothful they don't want to work and meanwhile yeah. they're like the average male blackfoot was like six foot four eating better than <laughs> anyone who's ever lived in the history of the world it just yes, it didn't so. that much work to eat that well yeah. and like, you were crushing it without working very hard and then yeah. to keep with the indigenous thing for a minute you know one of the original, and this was actually for white people and indigenous people on this continent, mm. like unregulated burning would like really mm. freaked out the powers that be. That was like, that was like a thing. Yes. Where like, What are you doing? Like, you're just like sort of ad hoc managing land. It freaked people out. It freaked out Spanish and French governors when Anglo guys would do it mm. in the Southeast. Yeah. And it freaked out on the Klamath drainage in the 1912s 
uh, when grandmothers would do it to burn willow and hazel. Uh, and it was the, it was almost the same language, like this sort of uncontrolled. Yeah, amazing, force. right? Yeah, and, because okay. anyway, control is, I think, the key word yeah. there, right? So like not understanding to an extent a lot of it is based in like classist stuff so in the in the early conservation movement you've got people saying like their properties are so gross and dirty like they don't have they they don't follow any sort of norms of cleanliness like the poor people that live there they keep trash all over and it's like well that's a control issue for you right mm -hmm. you don't like the way that looks and you can't control that they're put their tin cans in their front yard so like, and and, and that, this was seen as a reason to clear out people from what are now like the Adirondacks parks, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So anyway, it's all, it just doesn't sit right with me, even <laughs> though, of course, I probably don't want to see a yard full of trash either. Like, so anyway, this is where my sort of conflict comes in. Right. And, you know, I, I'll yeah. just go back to something we talked about earlier, because I think it is super, super relevant. Like, I think part of why we have this big problem in the United States today is a lot of the people who design environmental policy are people who went to Duke, Yale, Montana State, but went grew up yeah. in Boston, grew up in, you know, grew up in Portland, grew up in New York, and they really, really love nature. Like, they love the idea of nature. It's super cool. But they don't really know that much about it. They're not really that comfortable on it. They've never made their living from it. And so the idea that people could, without regulation, without the force of the market ordering things, actually mm. take and give in ways that were maybe not as detrimental as you might think they would be, is very anathema to them. It's very it's very yes. scary to them. Uh, yes. And I think it's a real huge problem because uh, it makes everyone I think so too. either an extractor and an enemy of the environment or like a don't touch it be nice do gooder and yes the truth is yeah. there there's something way in the middle with a lot of ranchers with a lot of loggers a lot of these people actually do care about this stuff and know about it in a way that they could probably take care of it if they were given the chance and i think we exactly. may be using that chance. yeah yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah and i don't you know i that leads i suppose well into talking about community forests and stuff but yeah. um I think a lot about this, right? And and part of why I think about it is that, you know, we were talking about the convoy, but uh, I grew up in Southern Alberta in Canada. This is like ranching country right by the Montana border. And my concept of environmentalism around that time was that it was the thing that the conservative families around me hated mm -hmm. and and didn't respect. Um, but also, you know, I don't think I was like, I think I was a teenager, not quite getting it at the time, but like the, the people that I grew up with, like, they know the prairies, they mm -hmm. know it, know it, they use it. They know when it, they know when the, when it needs to be rested and when it needs to be tilled and that they also know the impacts of like industrial agriculture and what it has kind of forced their family farms to become right mm -hmm. and so that was a motivating that was deep down something that really motivated me was trying to figure out these folks that like really live in the at the crossroads and like what leads to the the sort of disenfranchisement and the and the um anger that might lead someone to just just kind of hate the government yes. and mm -hmm. hate hate and conservationists and just kind of go all the way swing all the way to the far right you know mm -hmm. you know as a, uh, as a response yeah uh, it's a funny funny story here uh i know you just did hal herring's podcast um yeah. so uh, last, not last time, but one time that I visited Hal, it was right at the start of COVID. I was feeling, I was feeling this force of kind of regulation and and feeling like some kind of weird dystopia was descending. And my girlfriend and I were feeling it really, really hard. And everybody's running up to Montana, and I was like, I got to get out of here. Uh, and we actually <laughs> crossed. We crossed oh, northern Montana. We crossed northern Montana into Canada illegally, down into those canola <laughs> fields, and you could actually see. And That's this where was I grew up. Me, yeah. The Montana side was a lot of wildflowers, pretty low density of cattle on that side. And you step over the fence and it's just endless yellow, like Managed. the canals in bloom. And it was 
you know, I was like, I'm not comfortable mm. walking. This. Like, it's probably really poisonous, you know, really freaky. Mm. But so anyway, I know that. I don't know the, I don't know much about like canola management, but certainly there's, I mean, it is like you're saying, I grew up with that, like in the background yeah. for me, that yeah, level of yellow. Yeah. Um. Um. So let's talk, uh, let's talk about kind of the global, I feel like we've mm. actually sketched this really well. Like we sort of sketched the, yeah, the, the kind of did. issues at, at play here. Let's talk about, is there a solution to this kind of thing? Like, is there, mm. is there a way forward? Is there some kind of hope? I've talked about my hopes yeah. about this kind of stuff before with regard to Northern California, but maybe on a global scale. Um, yeah. Uh, actually, I should say first maybe give us a little window into poaching on a global scale and then talk sure. about kind of community forests. Yeah. So the final kind of quarter or third of my book, I talk about it on a global scale. And the reason why I did that is because, first of all, I don't think that you can talk about like poaching and illegal logging without talking, without noting the fact that this is happening on just unbelievable scales in the global south right and also I really wanted that to kind of bring in and touch on the fact that most of the products that we have in our home most of the wood in our home is not coming from northern California like my desk didn't come from there it came from wood that was harvested in Peru probably right mm -hmm. and so that wood is also poached on all sorts of scales it is one of the sort of leading organized crime uh, networks in the world is around timber. Um, most of the endangered species that are listed in the CITES appendix, which is this kind of very um, technical term for a convention, but that basically regulates what is what it is an endangered and traded species around the world. Mm -hmm. So you've got a couple appendices and some of them are like highly illegal, highly endangered, highly traded, you know. Anyway, trees make up the vast majority of that timber and plant life. And so we often hear about uh, like rhino horn, elephant tusk, pangolin scales, turtles, uh, but timber is, is really a driving, mm -hmm. a huge economic driving force in the underground uh, illegal wildlife trade. Um, and so I went to Peru for that and that was that that's related to my National Geographic uh, funding and and kind gotcha. of how they funded me and that's where the um the explorer sort of name comes from but uh, I you know I went to Peru I went to a couple regions there and 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 learned about how timber poaching uh, happens on indigenous concession land um and that that's kind of due to the uh, uh demographics of their country uh but you know, timber poaching, illegal logging happens there on scales where, you know, you might see huge clear cuts. But at the same time, there are a number of trees that are like very reminiscent of a, of a redwood, including one called a Shiwawako. And it's uh, in one of the um, concessions that I did reporting in, it really echoed what I was seeing in the Pacific Northwest. So you've got, you know, um, a remote sort of managed conservation land uh where people have gone in and they're they're cutting down trees like one or two and you know here and there and selling them to mills in nearby cities and um when i was asking the land managers who's doing this they were saying for new migrants to the region often who um you know find that they can turn it really quickly into a mill who doesn't ask questions and they're not from here and they come in and they set up their their tents and and take down these trees and set up mills in the forest. Uh, so it was a really interesting kind of. I remember at one point I was looking at um, the sort of area where these poachers had been staying, and it looked just like a tent encampment out on oh. Vancouver Island that I had been reporting yeah. on. And I thought, well, here's your parallel, right? Like, yeah. what do you have but immense poverty and this this kind of confidence that you know how to do a job you know how to take down a tree and you know how to mill it and you you find somewhere that's going to take it pretty quick for you and it enters the market so i bet there was a lot of trash around that around that campsite. there was a lot of trash <laughs> around that campsite and there oh. was you know leftover um chains and logging materials yeah. 
right? Um, um, it looked like a, it looked like a work site. Yeah. So uh, the thing, I mean, I think the the key point in all of this, and listeners to the Do podcast are going to be well aware of this, but you know, the thing that drives me crazy about sort of the American logging wars and whatever you want to call them, the, the shutting down of public lands logging is that people are talking about saving the trees. Yeah. Well, okay, good for you. Yes. Good for you. But did you stop using those desks? Did you stop building houses? Because if not, no. you didn't save trees. Those trees are still coming from somewhere. And yeah, this is a big thing for me too. So we can, we can really dig into this, but um, the demand that we place on the system means that illegal logging is going to continue yeah. because, you know, and, and, you know, anyway, this is not really my realm, but I feel like we hear a lot more now about fast fashion and how bad that is. And, uh, you know, factory farms may be for a certain demographic of people and how we don't want to support those, but like furniture is a huge yes. market that is just yes. under, under looked at, under considered. Um, and, like Ikea recently actually. was found using poached wood. Like it's just massive. You know? let, let me stop you there actually. Cause a, a very good friend of mine found an absolute monster story of Ikea logging the yes. last. That was the, your friend. Yeah. Yeah. That my, yeah okay. That's Alex Salmon. I'll, I'll, I'll pitch. Okay. This yes. Um, that's Alex Salmon writing in the new Republic. I think you can get at least one story per month off, off the paywall from them. And it's a really long, great story about, him mm -hmm. hanging out with rangers in the last mm -hmm. old growth um, of Eastern Europe, essentially, where yes. Ikea is cutting those trees as fast as they humanly can because they're trying to get in preventions. They're trying to get in various EU regulations. And Ikea is getting in under the freaking door um, yeah. and taking those trees at a crazy rate. And it is. Yes. And, yeah. and that directly ends up in our, do you know what I mean? Like the, the, when you can when you can see a company like that, it really shines a light for you on how. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, Home Depot was selling parquet flooring that was poached from a conservation area in Indonesia. Like it's yeah. just these are they, they are literally ending up in our houses. It's not it's not sad in a in a sense, only because like you're saying you're taking down an old growth. It's sad because of like how we consume it. And it just like gets mm -hmm. delivered to our front door and we have no connection to it at yeah. all and you run out of cares about your about it you buy a new one um yeah. you know and i i you know part of what i'm interested in in community forests is also just like thinking a little bit more about like community artisan work um and you know derek hughes turned bowls you know he was a beginner but he turned his own bowls and he was using poached wood to like do his own art Mm -hmm. you know and i i don't think it's right to use poached wood for that but i also think well you know why is it worse for me to buy a i, I didn't do this but like why would it be worse for me to buy a redwood turned bowl from Derek Hughes who i've met and or buy, buy an acacia bowl from ikea that came from thailand yeah i have no idea where that came from you know um well and, and the and same it, with firewood the same with with charcoal charcoal is a massively illegal industry lots of lots of charcoal is coming from poached trees and there is a you know there's a very small cottage industry of artisanal charcoal and <laughs> i realize that sounds very hip and like whatever but part of me thinks well maybe i should be looking for charcoal that comes from my part of the province you know mm -hmm. and i mean this gets to the heart uh, maybe I'm more radical on this issue than you, but like this mm. gets to the heart of kind of, I think the question that your book raises, which is like, you know, to some degree, who are the true criminals? Like, and if Ikea is doing, is is legally taking at this moment, old growth forest at a crazy rate in Romania, and there just isn't somebody powerful enough to stop them versus Derek Hughes taking a little bit from a park. Like, mm our notion of criminal is really, really messed up in that regard, you know? And like, we just don't have, a, we yeah. don't have a framework that describes that. Like Ikea isn't poaching, you know, they're doing it legally, but it's, but it's worse. Or illegally, <laughs> yeah, you know, but, sometimes illegally, but um, right, yeah. no, I'm like, it's, I think that you ask an important question and I've had this framed to me also, frankly, in another way of like, why would you write this? Like, why wouldn't you write about, like you're saying Ikea, like why not write a book about, mm -hmm 
these massive global industries. And, you know, I get that, but I actually think that by writing about the little poaching case or little in quotes poaching right. case in, in the Redwoods, you can actually get to those bigger questions a lot more um, easily than simply kind of laying out the shocking numbers. Um, but yeah, I mean, this is, this is kind of a, even a guiding question for work that I'm doing now or work that I want to do, which is, you know, I don't know. I, I think this is a perfect question for a DO podcast, which is like, is it, is it romantic to, to think that we can go back to a time when maybe I just want buy one desk and I hold it for the rest of my life and it comes from a tree that came down and I know the guy who made it. Right. You know? And maybe that person is Derek Hughes who used to poach. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know like if that's really sort of naive and romantic, but it's it's kind of where I'm at sometimes. Right. Mm -hmm. Same I with think food. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think, I mean, I think that that vision, that question is the animating question to some degree of DO in, in many ways. Yeah, exactly. Um, yeah. Uh, I, my question, I guess, in terms of policy stuff is like, I mm -hmm. actually, like, I'm the the biggest doomer I know, which is saying a lot, honestly. Yeah. Um, oh. But I'm actually, to some degree, a bit of an optimist in terms of like what could be done on public on American public lands. Like I actually think American public yeah. lands, the basic idea is pretty close to being right. Like the basic idea of like we keep it as a commons, but there's a guy who says like, "Hey, you're taking too much of the commons. I'm gonna mess you up." Like that. That mm -hmm. is a pretty potentially functional modern approach to how to handle this stuff. I'm a, I'm actually confident about that. Um, if, yeah, and you if know what? I actually think that De not now, but yeah, I think that Derek Hughes, for instance, would agree with you. You know, he said to me in an interview, like maybe I'd be less likely to do this if it was my neighbor telling me to stop. Right? Mm -hmm. Like, like they the the Rangers don't know me. They didn't grow up here. Uh, you know, I I think that hits on also something that we haven't really touched about, which is like the sort of imploring often by urban people to rural people to just leave an area mm -hmm. go find work yeah. somewhere else but like yeah. that is really not going to happen and it's a waste of not only is it a waste of time to ask that of communities but it's like really insulting but anyway so if Derek Hughes is saying my neighbor isn't the one telling me to stop it's a guy who's transferred in from wherever mm -hmm. and he's got a gun and he's pulling me over like I actually think he was getting at something much bigger there right yeah. which is like who enforces and what and who gives how do we even think about the hiring around this stuff mm -hmm. um and I'm, I'm interested in that like this is why i'm interested in community forests there's still poaching that happens in community forests but there's also like a lot of like community level um sort of problem solving around that that can happen when it's not a federal agency or even a state agency so. so so let's actually wrap up by maybe community forests are a vision of the future. Sure. Uh, to be honest, it's not a topic I know that much about. Um, so I'm okay. going to most people listening also don't know that much about it. Can you give yeah. us a kind of, is it a movement? Is this a movement enough of a thing to be called that? It's a good question. I mean, there, there's, there's, I think about 37 of them in British Columbia. I, they're not new, but I do wonder if they're getting a little bit more, um, uh, more attention lately, uh, partly due to actually the interesting conversations that we're having around like Indigenous guardian programs and land back. I think that they do kind of fit within the same structure. And so often, you know, I can I can speak from the BC context. I'm, I'm not entirely sure about uh, like different states, but um, the community forest in my backyard, it is, it, you know, it used to be what we would call crown lands, which would be similar to forest service. So a land that, you know, you could get a logging tenure on or, you know, maybe a, it would be common for like an outdoorsman club to have maybe like a shooting range or something on there. Um, and it's usually a group that's governed by a board, but the, you know, the board is all community members that are, that are buying this land from back from the province back from Forest Service and they're managing it for first of all multiple uses and it's also run entirely by the community so the funds stay within like the profits stay within the community they often mm. just 
or like old school, like going to fund the school basketball team or whatever. Um, and all, in these forests, you'll see, you know, there'll be like a mountain bike path and there will be, um, you know, the one near me, the local university has a research station in it. Mm -hmm. And there's also logging. There's logging in it. So like you'll go on a hike or on a, just on a walk down to it and you'll see a, a stump every once in a while where a tree has been taken down and the the employment is all local mm -hmm. um and so this this kind of sprung up when the when the logging industry around my town was was kind of on its last legs um and the mill is also local um that they take it to mm -hmm. and so the profits are just like i mean they're nowhere near going to be ever as big as like a pacific a pacific lumber or a, right. um Louisiana Pacific, sorry, that's what I'm thinking of. They're, they're not going to be anywhere near that, but they do stay in the town. And, uh, you know, um, I've spoken to a number of different community um, community forest managers, and some of them say, we still have poaching, but we know who it is who does, you know, there was, there's one community forest who said, we know who was doing it, and we approached them, and we offered them a job. Like, yeah. if you're going to come on here and cut the wood, why don't you just get paid for it you know yeah um I think that it offers a little bit of the flexibility that that rightfully the federal government cannot offer right yep. so like also like the the National Park Service it's very unlikely that they're gonna like hire someone with a record <laughs> mm -hmm. um from poaching or whatever even uh but the community forest could they can find their ways around doing that you know whether it's through a grant or you know working through community services or social services to do that. So um, that's, you know, they, again, I'm I'm loath to say that they can replace the logging industry. I don't think right. that can happen. And I don't think it should happen. But I do think that there are very select cases, in, but in a lot of towns where you'd have a really solid employment base for a number of people that want to stay where they are and keep doing what they're doing and they love logging. <laughs> Right. That's really cool. Um, I really like that. Do you know? Do you yeah, know how many acres yeah. that forest is that you're talking about? Oh, I can I can look it up. It's split over a few parcels, actually. So let me just look it up. I'm just curious. It's gonna take it's me a like, while to find it. Yeah, it's it's not very um. It's is is it's a matter of thousands of acres though. To, in order yeah. to be providing that it must be it must be many thousands of acres that which is yes. really cool yeah yeah um, it is yeah and it's you know then they can also they for instance there was a burn there last year and they worked with the first yeah. nation that's that's on our land right so uh, or sorry that we're on their land um the first nation whose territory we're on so um it's uh again like i i don't think anything is perfect but i am really excited by this idea yeah, think, you know what? I, hearing yeah. you say this, I'm actually pretty excited by it too. The unfortunate, yeah, thing, because yeah, of, because of our federal regulations, you would not be able to do that stuff. If 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 this happened, and because of spotted owl ESA and stuff like that, you wouldn't be able to do that stuff in California. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's mm -hmm. something that we're gonna right have on to a state about. by state basis, right? Yeah. It'll change. Yeah. Um, state by state, but also just the way that the weird federal land regulations work out like you're still subject to NEPA so you would still have mm. to do like crazy permitting every time you did a cut stuff yeah. like that um, yeah yeah so. the permitting thing right but also the benefit sometimes of a community forest is that you've got sort of different levels of work like well anyway it, in this context it wouldn't work but um you know they have they have people that work in an office that do all yeah. that and then I they see. just that essentially are calling people in to say, do you have like, you know, you have an excavator. Can you go do this? Right. So it's like, it's very local economy in that way. Um, that's amazing. I think that, well, that's such mm -hmm. a good, um, yeah. I mean, we're out of time anyway, basically, but I think that's yeah, a good, that's sort okay. of like DO note to end on because it is actually a really cool thing that I personally didn't know that much about. And I do think is a great model. Yeah. Um, and I think it is too. And I, you know, I think that it can also be applied across all sorts of industries, for instance, um, not just logging. Yeah. Right. Um, but uh, I mean, it, it's when I say it's imperfect, I mean, it's still humans that are making decisions about how to use 
how to use a parcel of land, right? So like, I don't want to imply that there are no arguments at the community forest about if one area should be logged or not, or right. if a scientific survey should be happening in one area or not. Um, but it is, the decision is being made in that very sort of, uh, I want to say imminent, but like very face-to-face -face way mm -hmm. with your neighbor. Mm -hmm. And people are not always happy. Yeah, that's true. But I mean, you're also probably not going to like turn like start believing <laughs> conspiracy theories and right. stuff about the government, right? Right. You know. Right. So, well, Lindsay, thank you so much. Um, do you have anything to plug? Do you? Have, what are you working on next? Oh gosh. Um, I think plugging my book is just fine for now. Yeah. Um, I'm working on, you know, a feature that I don't know when it will come out, but it's actually about offshore drilling and it has a sort okay. of similar, similar questions. I'm, I'm starting work on a new project that's about community land. So I'm really pleased to hear okay. that you're interested in this because it's kind of jumping off of um, community forests and looking at community land ownership on a much broader scale and uh essentially land back movements but i'm trying to shy away uh from from kind of pigeonholing it into that mm -hmm. realm because um it's happening all around the world in all sorts of different ways so cool um well yeah. everyone look out for that uh lindsay is the author of tree thieves um check it out and thank you so much for coming on the do podcast thanks for having me mm -hmm.